Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the simple and AI-powered rewards and recognition platform for employee engagement. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. I'm your host, Sushmita, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about HR innovation and the future of work. We'll cover a wide range of things in this episode, including how HR can have a greater effect on leaders, organizations, and employees. We'll discuss the attributes that make a great HR officer. We'll talk about how technology and the future of work are affecting strategic workforce planning. For the same, I'm so honored and excited uh, to welcome our guest speaker today, Dave Ulrich, who is a university professor author, speaker, management coach, and management consultant. He is a professor of business at the Ross School of Business and co-founder and principal at the RBL Group. Welcome to the show, Dave. Sushmita, what a privilege to join you. I'm honored to uh, participate in, in this discussion. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you for joining us. So would you like to give a brief about your background and your journey in the corporate world before we start with the discussion? No problem. It's a very simple background. I did my graduate work in in business in the field called organizational behavior. I got into it a little bit by fluke, but I've studied that. And for the last many, many years and even decades, I've tried to figure out how do organizations be more effective at creating value for others. And so I start by thinking about what makes an organization? How does it work? How does it better serve its employees, deliver its strategy, serve customers, investors, and communities? Um, My wife told me when I got into this field, and she's a very good psychologist, that I have OCD. I I, I, I got this in one of your previous uh, sessions, and I was about to ask you about that. Yeah, please continue. Well, and what that means is organization compulsive disorder. And, (laughs) And I look at an organization and try to improve it. And so when I go to a store or a restaurant or even to church, I have in my mind a checklist. Here's how you can be more effective. Uh, There are some people that don't want to go to stores or restaurants or churches with me because I tend to uh, give feedback when it's not always wanted. But I enjoy studying organizations. That's what I have a passion for and, uh, and have spent much of my career trying to study through research. I've been a professor at the University of Michigan for uh, probably about 40 years, have written books and done research uh, to try to figure out how do organizations be more effective. Amazing. So I believe you wouldn't have been got gotten to where you are now today, you know, if it weren't your passion, right? So if I'm not mistaken, you have had a successful uh, career spanning of uh, 30, 4 to 35 years, if I'm not wrong, or 40 years. That's true. I started my uh, thank you for reminding me how old I am. <laughs> I started my uh, graduate work in 1977 and finished my PhD in 82. So that's about 40 years. That's a, right. that's a long time. Mm-hmm. So uh, what have been your top uh, organizational priorities throughout your journey? There's two priorities that I've done. And, and I, I'm betting, Sushmita, you've done the same exercise. I'd love to have yours. They're value clarification. What are your values? What are the things that matter most to you professionally? For me, I've discovered there's two. One is to learn. Hopefully over those 40 years, I keep learning and growing. I have a rule of thumb when I do presentations that I have 15 to 20% new material every 12 to 18 months. And so I want to keep learning and rolling forward if I could. And second, that my learning is not about me. It's about how I help others get better. So learning to create value for others. That's my personal passion. And I try to help organizations do the same thing. How do we as an organization improve so that others get value from those improvements? Right. Learning forward and uh, I think also failing forward. I love the failing forward. I, uh, my wife, who's a psychologist, has studied uh, co- or mind or uh, growth mindset by Carol Dweck. So I made my wife a pillow that said, "I'm not failing. I'm learning." And uh, that that embroidery is on a pillow now on the couch in her office. That we we don't fail. We learn. And 
So when something goes wrong, that's an opportunity to explore what we could have done better and improve in the future. So I love the failing forward. I'm not failing. I'm learning. Uh, to me, that's it's actually a really good thing because I fail a lot. <laughs> and if I'm not learning from it, I'm going to be in trouble. Okay, great. Okay, so coming to the topic today, Dave, HR innovation and the future of work. So, HR uh, is uh, all about the people, and uh, on you know also it's also about enabling uh, people to do things differently, so they so that they, they can go above and beyond their job role across the organization. So, how does HR do that? I mean, nowadays, just a pat on the back or a thumbs up aren't probably the best way to do it, right? Yeah, I, I would change the definition just a little bit. Mm. I've been using the term lately, human capability. And I think HR is about creating value for others. So that's the logic. But there's three things HR contributes to do that. One is the people, human capital, people, the employee, the talent, the workforce. That's so critical. If you look at your fingers, the five fingers represent people. But HR does more than that. It builds human capability and the human is the people. The capability is the organization. So turn your fingers into a fist. Do we have the right team? Do we have the right organization? Do we have the right workplace? Do we have the right culture? Do we have what I call capabilities? And then combine your fingers and your fist. That's leadership. Do we have leaders, not just at the top, but distributed throughout the organization? So my view is that HR is not about HR. It's about creating value for others, the premise, through A, talent, people, B, organization, culture, and C, leadership. And when HR innovates in those areas, uh, it, it builds the right people, the right organization, and the right leadership to help us uh, companies and an organization succeed, uh, not only in the marketplace, but with multiple stakeholders. Right. So I'm sure uh, while doing that, uh, there are a lot many of challenges that HR face, right? Especially in today's uh, this uh, COVID era, you know. No question. Yeah, a lot of people in the legacy of every profession, marketing or finance or uh, supply chain has legacy. HR has a legacy. It grew up in in India, in fact, where many of the innovative HR practices occurred in Europe and the United States being very operational terms and conditions of work the labor force the contract how do we how do we set the terms and conditions and then evolve through what are some emerging practices to take care of those people and organization around talent and compensation and org development then it became strategic and how do those practices drive strategy now in the hr field we're trying to create value added how does what we do create value not only for our employees and our strategy, but for our customers, our communities and our investors. And in the last 18 months with the horrendous demands of not only the global pandemic, which has affected the world, but around the world, political toxicity and racial issues and injustice issues, all of those issues are more or less the people and organizational challenges. And hopefully HR professionals can rise to that opportunity to not just do the administrative work, which has to be done, mm -hmm. or the best practice work or the strategic work, but mm -hmm. work that creates value in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I believe many of the HRs are also struggling with, you know, HR analytics now, right? And there, some of them are also uh, struggling with the use of technology to get deeper bonds, right? In their work. Both of those are so them. true. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's false hope with technology. There's hope. Technology allows us to have this conversation. Technology is, is about connection and, and relationships. But the falseness is that it doesn't replace face-to-face -face personal connection. That uh, I remember a few years ago, and I probably shouldn't share a personal example, but our son was engaged to a great young woman. And they've mm -hmm. now been married for over 10 years. So this was some time ago. Right. And he spent almost all of his time connecting with her through technology, tweeting, Instagram, mm -hmm. texting. And he said, Dad, you have any advice? And I said, yes, yeah, spend some time with her one-on-one -on -one personally. Mm -hmm. Because when you're married, you're not going to just connect through technology. You've got to learn how she lives and how she acts and how she responds. Mm -hmm. And he got married and he said, oh, Dad, you were right. <laughs> uh, the technology is a great thing but it cannot replace that personal connection and, uh, and intimacy that we need to be part mm -hmm. of a community. 
I mean, it's so much more than just getting those likes on LinkedIn post. You know, it has to be really, you know, interactive and in person. No question. I, I think many of us are experiencing LinkedIn fatigue. Uh, in 2020, I added up. I did over 200 webinars and podcasts on LinkedIn. I wasn't traveling, and I, I got to where I could do it, but it still felt a little bit empty. In fact, it's an interesting thing. Tomorrow, the first time in 18 months, I'm doing a live session with a couple of hundred people. Um, I'm actually a little bit nervous. <laughs> I hope it's like riding a bicycle that I can stand in front of people and actually talk without telling them to turn off their LinkedIn distractions. And anyway, so uh, yeah, technology has been a blessing. It connects us in some incredible ways, but it also distances us in some difficult ways. Right. Also, uh, Dave, uh, when when you talk about initiating behavioral changes at work, I mean, of course, that that's I think very uh, that's not a very easy thing. Means you have to you have a business to run at the same time, right? So both of them has to coexist, isn't it? You know, one of the things, Shishmita, we found, we look at what are the skills of a great leader, and there's kind of a hierarchy. You've got to be authentic. We have to trust you. We have to believe in you. You have to have emotional intelligence. You have to be strategic. But as you move up that hierarchy of skills, the one that our research found is you've got to navigate paradox. Paradox is what you just said. I need to be operational day to day, and I need to be strategic long term. I need to be top down as a leader and set direction, and I need to be bottom up and engage others. I need to be long term, short term, whatever paradox you want to run into. And the great leaders seem to know how to navigate between those two guardrails. And as a result, they seem to have a perspective that they zoom out and they zoom in. They know how to help people move forward by making those tensions that are part of paradox into opportunities to learn and to grow. Mm-hmm. Employee learning and development is also another um, area, you know, where we see a lot of HR innovation. So, how can we learn in an era where the workforce is becoming more diverse and uh, mobile? Well, hopefully, we begin by respecting diversity. The diversity is not just an organization counting numbers of people with different backgrounds or orientations. It's not just a training program. It's not just a communication. It's actually a fundamental assumption about how we lead and run our organization, and that assumption is that my job as a leader is to use my power to empower others. My job is to help others get better, and a second assumption is that everyone has something to offer. Every employee in the organization, no matter what, what his or her background, they have something to offer, and my job is to discover that offering and help them, and again to use my power to empower them. If we use that assumption, learning becomes a setting where divergent ideas help us roll forward to future thinking, and managing that learning process becomes so powerful. To attend as teams, to have leaders take the lead, to shape an agenda. Um, and to use learning as a setting for growth and for innovation. Right. So formal education, like formal training, is also uh, quite important, doesn't it? No question. Uh, formal education becomes a form of credentialing. That, in fact, I get uh, amazed in our field that if we don't learn something, we end up reinventing it. In 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 our field in HR, if we haven't learned what our predecessors have done. We discover something, and they go, uh, "We did that 20 years ago," and so and so that education allows us to build on the past to create a future. Another paradox. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. So, um, Dave, how do you see the future of HR? I am an optimist. I think uh, as long as HR is not about HR, it's about creating value for others through talent, leadership, and organization. If we can keep that. In mind, the future is incredible, because I love the line. Now is the time. Coming out of the 2008 and 2009 around the world was the financial and economic crisis, and there were a number of changes made about managing cash and managing debt. 2020 and 21, I think, will be remembered as the people and organizational crisis. And if HR can rise to that opportunity and not see it as a demand. I think we see the HR field becoming even more central to what we're doing in organizations. Right. So, do you think uh, the organizations are prepared with the new HR benefit? I hope so. 
uh, not all organizations and not all HR people. Uh, we've learned sadly in in this pandemic that vaccines will mitigate the risk of the pandemic. And yet there's still, I don't know what it is in your experience where you live in India or in Australia or in Brazil, or but in America, there's still 10 to 20% who refuse to be vaccinated. Mm. And you go, I don't understand that <laughs> because but, but I do understand that there's still in the United States, I don't know the data in other countries, about 15% who won't wear seatbelts, about 10% who still think the world is flat. I mean, and, and I think in some levels, we got to move away from that group and focus on the other group and say, how do we help those who are willing and able to move forward, move forward in a positive way? And, and I hope that's what we see as, uh, as we look to the future of HR. Okay. Brilliant, Dave. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next question, uh, we'd love to understand what is the outside in view of HR and culture, Dave? Well, I have listened to uh, some of your previous sessions uh, in which you really explained this one uh, very beautifully, you know, with your uh, family's Disney experience. So it would be great if you can uh, sh uh, share a few words with your real life example. Well, let me let me start with uh, the family uh, and outside in is a simple example. Is, as you pointed out so graciously at the beginning, I'm old uh, and I've been married for 45 years. Whenever okay. I get my wife a gift, who defines the value of the gift? And it's not me, it's her. When I was first married, I would get her tickets to sporting events and she would say, enjoy yourself <laughs> uh, because that didn't create value for her. And so the goal of value is not what we do, it's what somebody gets because of what we do. So um, actually, it's interesting. Yesterday, I said to my wife, uh, what should we do to celebrate it? It doesn't happen to be her birthday. It's mine. But what would be meaningful? And we decided last night to schedule a trip to visit one of our children because that would be meaningful for both her and for me. Values defined by the receiver more than the giver. Now, in organizations, we often talk about values. We talk about the values of an organization, the roots of the tree. I would like to pivot that. The values of the organization should create value for the customers and the investors. And so instead of thinking as values as the roots of the tree, think about them as the leaves of the tree. What does a, what value does a customer get from the values that we have in our organization? That leads me to redefine culture. Culture is not just a value statement and a set of behaviors. It's mm -hmm. an identity in the marketplace that captures the customer so that they will then create a better success for the organization and allow us to create the right workplace. I think culture is not just the values inside. It's the value of those values outside. Right. So uh, is there a message that you would like to give to our listeners today? I hope, and again, I don't want to impose my value on someone else, but I hope that most of us who listen are committed to learning, to seeing challenges as opportunities, to replacing fear with hope, and also to be willing to give back. Um, I remember, and let me let me frame that with two, three questions. Uh, I had the chance to do a commencement speech uh, for a university, and I don't have a rags to riches story like Stephen Jobs or Oprah Winfrey or others. But I coach and the message I'd give to people is question one, what do I want? What are my values? What matters to me? What are my strengths? What are my passions? Number two, who do I serve? Who will get value because of what I do? And number three, how do I institutionalize? How do I build? How do I make an organization better? Now, having said that, uh, Sushmita, I am not going to leave. You're relatively new to HR. You're well known as a, as a broadcaster. In the last year or two, as you've gotten to know HR, what do you think HR contributes? What would you say? You've done podcasts. You're a thoughtful observer. You're a clever thinker. What do you think HR should pay attention to? I'm turning the tables on you. I think uh, during all this uh, technological improvements, I believe the basic uh, you know, the, the basic human element in HR has been lost. So it's time to reintroduce the human element into HR. Um, in fact, uh, the HR team should also work constantly to create an atmosphere and environment and a culture uh, that encourages employees uh, you know, to bring their best version of being human to work every day. What a great message, 
the human and human resources needs to be looked at aggressively. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great reminder. Thank and you, thank so you much. for this discussion. Yeah. So uh, finally, how can our listeners reach out to you, Dave? I decided I've written a lot of books. I think it's a lot of books, but it's a lot of books and they take a year or two to get written and published. So I've started posting on LinkedIn. Hmm. Just follow me on LinkedIn. I post a new article every Tuesday and I mm -hmm. also get to engage with people. Um, okay. On an article, I get comments and if people disagree with me, that's wonderful mm -hmm. because that's how I learn. So the easiest way is to follow me on LinkedIn. Okay, thanks for joining me today, Dave. That was a great conversation. I hope you'd, you know, we'll get back to you soon in our podcast. I hope so. Thank you again. And thank you for your insight. That was very, uh, very, a very good reminder and very helpful to remember the human and human resources. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. Please do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and our YouTube channel for new episodes.